Hello, this is Felipe Wicochea. And I'm Gary Leland, and you're listening to Episode 76 of the Crypto Cousins Podcast. Feed your interest in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies by joining Hall of Fame podcaster Gary Leland on the Crypto Cousins Podcast. And remember, we are all cousins in the world of crypto. This week's price of Bitcoin. $4,056. Now that's up $373. Or 10.1% over the last seven days. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Welcome to the show. Philip, thanks for joining me on the show. Thank you for having me. Always a, a pleasure to chat with you for a few minutes. Yeah, how was your Christmas? Was awesome, awesome. How about yours? It was good. Had the family in and um, did a lot of work, but uh, found a lot of time for the kids and grandkids that I have now that I'm getting to be an old man. So that's a new experience since they're four and two or three and two. I can't keep up with it. Well, kids, kids are the, the life of Christmas. It's always awesome to have kids around it this time of year. And they get so excited about the littlest things. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like that thing is true where they find the box and they want to play. In. You got any more boxes I can play in? Well, that's what keeps us young, being being able to wonder about uh, small things and, and to keep that sense of awe for innovation and, and technology. And that's one of the things that I enjoy so much about this space that we, we, we wonder and we discover a lot of things going on. There's always a lot of things going on. You know, I, I know that uh, – I can't remember. What, what's your uh, better half's name? Uh, Jill. Jill. I'm sorry. I can't remember that. I see her all the time on Facebook. And she seems to be – I've met her at Bitblock Boom. She seems to be a wonderful person. And I don't know – what brought me on to Jill, though, is I was going to say, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I know Jill has because she messages on it, uh, my daily show, 4-Minute Crypto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen it, yeah. I like doing that show because I learn so much, and that's what I was trying. It took me a long time to get there, but you said you're always learning something. I like doing that show every day because it makes me research news articles, you know? Yeah. And so I'm forced to, like, learn a bunch of stuff that I wouldn't be learning normally. It's something that I very often share with my audience when they refer me as, like, the the expert or the guru or whatever, and I tell them, no, I just read more than you do. And before I uh, turn on the mic and the camera, I have to do my homework and I'm reading all the time. And I, I'm just a step ahead of you in terms of doing research. I'm no, no expert. I'm no guru, but I just read more. And, and it's, a, it's a blessing for me to have this uh, kind of opportunity to spend so much time researching and learning new things and then be able to talk with people and share this uh, road with uh, people like you and people uh, in, in, in your audience that are curious about this uh, incredible technology. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Like I said, I just think it's incredible technology. I, I tell people all the time, I, I start, well, I started my first e-commerce store in like 96. But I think that if you were to relate crypto to the state of technology using the internet as the, an example, I would think that we're like in 1991. I don't even think we're at 96 yet. The Netscape browser hasn't come out. There's a lot of things that haven't come out. Yeah, yeah. We're in a very early stage of development. And uh, also I have, uh, like you, the good luck or fortune or good timing. But pretty much all my professional career has been in and around the Internet. And I've seen going from having to send and receive emails using a uh, command line interface and a Unix uh, machine to being able to tell Siri to send an email or set an appointment. So uh, we've come very far. And in terms of development, yeah, it's it's really early in the game. Uh, when you look at it, there's a lot of things that are improving fast in terms of development. I think we're on, on steroids. And by that, I mean the timing of the uh, evolution that we're going to see is going to be faster than the Internet. Because before the Internet, there was, there was no Internet. There, was no, there were no tools for interaction and to bring together people with common ideas. Uh, it was like the, the road was not there. And now we have the road. And the cross-pollination of ideas, the collaboration between groups in different countries, different time zones, it's moving the space uh, really fast. So even though I agree that we're probably early 90s in, in comparison uh, with the development of the Internet, this time this is going to move way faster than the Internet did, in my opinion. 
And that's a very good point, too, because the infrastructure is there. It's just building the needed tools. Yeah, exactly. And and it's happening. I mean, if you see just the development of the Lightning Network infrastructure in the last 12 months, I mean, at the beginning of the year, there were like 13, 14 nodes, and, and now there's thousands of them. 3,500 to my last uh, count uh, mid-December. Well, that's moving pretty quickly, and it's, that's been a short amount of time. Hey, before we go too much further, for anyone who is listening that may not be familiar with this, have it give us a little bit of uh, just a little brief bio, real quick, of who you are. Well, very brief bio. I'm a software engineer by trade. I've been uh, working in and around the internet from very early in my career. I've been fortunate to work in different projects from building the first backbone nodes in Mexico in, in the early 90s to building the first uh, presidential campaign in Mexico using the internet as a primarily mean of communication in the early 2000s. And I built a voice over IP, IP company, kind of smaller version of Bonash. So we did voice over IP early on. And I've been always like looking for what's the next thing on the internet. And that's how I got into uh, cryptocurrency. And I was I was cooked. I, I was amazed by the technology. So most of my career has been around the internet uh, technology and in different facets. It's not been always the software component. I did build like physical backbones with uh, modems and racks and hardware and wires and stuff like that. So I've seen all sides of the internet. How about Crypto Mondes TV? Well, it started as a project uh, mainly to educate the uh, Spanish-speaking uh, community about the potential of the uh, cryptocurrencies, mainly because I saw first the vacuum. There was really no one talking about these topics in Spanish. It's uh, The technology itself is complex to understand, so even people who have a conversational level of English, uh, when you put the language barrier, and on top of that, the technology barrier becomes uh, really difficult. So even people who are functionally bilingual, uh, when it comes to all the nuance, uh, nuances of this technology, they need a little help in, in their own language. So I saw the, the, the void. I saw the need for someone to start speaking about this technology. So I launched the first the YouTube channel, and now we have a podcast, which... Tonight, we're going to reach the 100th episode of our podcast in Spanish. It's been really well uh, received in the Spanish-speaking uh, community, and I have an uh, audience all over the world. A anywhere when some where someone speaks Spanish, I have audience uh, members there from uh, Japan to Patagonia in Argentina, Canada, Europe, and uh, Asia and Russia and everywhere else. So very exciting uh, journey. Yeah, that's, that's pretty exciting. I went and looked at your Facebook page the other night. But yeah, as we talked recently about in Frisco, I don't speak Spanish, which I need to learn. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't able to enjoy it, but I really do need to, I need to make the move and get whatever I need to get. I'm sure there's like an app that can teach me a fundal rudimental, rudimentary understanding yeah, yeah. And and there's a podcast. I mean, a lot of since you understand the, the what I'm talking about, if you listen in Spanish, you'll catch a lot of uh, what I'm saying with uh, the podcast. And uh, it's it just uh, full immersion. We can have some tacos in Oak Cliff and you'll have your full immersion experience in Spanish. Well, that would be good. Uh, my daughter is becoming fluent in Spanish from working at a hospital, but she's just like able to pick up anything. Yeah, You know, we told her in high school, learn Spanish. That's going to be real important. So I knew it was important. She's 31 now. Yeah, She took German for some reason, I guess, because we wanted her to take Spanish probably, three years of it. And I talked to her. They said, how's that German doing you? <laughs> she goes, I probably speak Spanish now better than I do German. I said, yeah, hey. but even, even with German, I've always been a firm uh, believer based on my own experience that uh, being bilingual, even if it's a second language that it's not very popular or not a lot of people in your area are able to uh, speak. Your brain works differently. The way you think, the way you uh, are able to connect ideas, your brain paths are connected differently when you speak a second language. 
or when you learn music, when you you play or into music, when you learn a, a musical instrument or a second language, your brain works differently. I'm a huge proponent of these kind of uh, well, I am, skills. I, I, I agree with you 100%. We had her take violin for eight years, take a foreign language. I agree with you 100%. Do you think that those skills and the way that causes someone's brain to work by developing your mind that way makes it easier to pick up that third language? Yeah. I mean, the second language is always the hardest. Once you learn a second language, a third language is usually easier. And in many cases, it depends, of course, on the language that you choose. But for example, if uh, your daughter speaks uh, German, then probably uh, Dutch would be really easy to learn. Then you have another Germanic languages that would be really easy to pick up. Uh, same if she's learning Spanish, then suddenly Portuguese and Italian are going to be way easier to pick up. And then French is that why so many Europeans know so many languages? Because once they learn that second one, the other ones may be based off the second one they learned? Well, yeah, because most of the languages in, in Europe are, are related, but also it's proximity. By the time you drive from Dallas to El Paso, you go from Munich to probably France or something like that. You cross uh, four countries in, in the time you drive from here to El Paso in Nine hours drive, you cross all Europe and you cross many countries and uh, countries like Switzerland has three official languages. And then you have Belgium that has two official languages. And so it's proximity and it's uh, a lot of ha has to do that uh, languages are related in, in, that, in those regions. I guess soon the United States will have two official languages. I, I didn't know countries had two official languages. Well, uh, no, actually, it's unlikely. And the reason is the First Amendment. But it has something in there about language? Well, basically, freedom of speech means that you're able to uh, and you're allowed to speak whatever you want. And the government cannot impose any. Oh, we don't have an official language here is what you're saying. Yeah, the U.S. doesn't have an official oh, language. Oh, I, I didn't know that. I just assumed English was the official. Growing up, and I grew up in South Carolina. Yeah. I, I never even heard a word of Spanish until I was, until I took it in high school. I took it for one year in high school in 10th grade. That's the first time I even heard any Spanish, you yeah. know, you know, which, which things have changed now. But uh, I guess, you know, a lot of my thinking is related to how I grew up, you know, and growing up on a small island, you know, where there was nobody who spoke Spanish on my whole island, probably. Yeah, and, and a lot of people make that assumption that uh, English is the official language, but no, there's no official language for the U.S. government. And as long as the First Amendment remains, there's not going to be, because that would be the government is forcing you to speak in, in a specific language. And that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, unlike other countries, which do have, and I think most of them have uh, official languages, but uh, in, in that regard, that's part of uh, what makes this country unique is, is the First Amendment is very powerful and reaches a lot of emphasis uh, on uh, aspects of our lives uh, every day, including cryptocurrency, because part of code is, is speech, right? Right. So protocols like Bitcoin, which is a payment a value transfer protocol, is fundamentally speech. So it's also protected by the First Amendment. And this is one of the things that I, I find so fascinating that touches so many aspects, so many uh, realms. It challenges things like the First Amendment. It's freedom of speech. You're communicating value to another party, to another peer. So interfering with that is essentially interfering with communication, which is speech. It also has this angle with the uh, Citizens United uh, uh, Supreme Court ruling. I was, getting, I was just getting ready to bring that up. <laughs> money equals uh, speech. Right. So then you have a protocol that it's communication, that it's money, basically. And then it's protected by a First Amendment. And it's unique. You cannot protect the U.S. dollar with the First Amendment. It doesn't work. Because it's a, it's a physical transfer of uh, monetary value. There's no speech involved in the transfer of the U.S. dollar or any other currency. So there's a challenge in, in that front, from the front of uh, speech, from the front of jurisdiction, how you regulate all these uh, spaces, how you 
tax, how you all, there's so many challenges that are being faced with the emerge, uh, suddenly uh, rise of this uh, technology that we are just uh, scratching the surface of, of how, how powerful this, this is. And I think a lot of incumbents, central banks, the financial system, even governments are underestimating greatly how powerful the, this is. I have the good luck of being able to be in contact with a lot of people uh, throughout Latin America. And there's a shift of mentality. For decades, it was the only way to protect your money from the corrupt government was taking the money out of the country. And that's how wealthy families for generations protected their wealth in, in Latin America. Now, for the first time, the average Juan can take the country out of their money. So he keeps the value, he keeps the money, and what he's effectively doing is keeping the government out of their money without having to move the money out of the country. And it's available for everyone, unlike uh, generations before that it was like the wealth, well-to-do people who could have uh, bank accounts in the US or, or abroad and, and save some of their wealth. Now anyone can do it, and they're doing it, and they're doing it at a rapid pace. If you see all the stats on uh, uh, local trade in, in Venezuela, in Argentina, in Mexico, it's catching up. In uh, uh, Peru, it's moving fast, and it's going to be like uh, governments are going to be blindsided by this, uh, this technology, and they keep underestimating how transformative and how, how powerful it's, it's, uh, it is by its nature of being censorship uh, resistant and being unmutable and being a permissionless system. Well, like you said, Bitcoin, it doesn't care if you're black, if you're white, if you're rich or you're poor, if you're old or you're young, if you're, it doesn't care. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And that's why people are realizing that you don't have to be rich. You don't have to be privileged or you don't have to be in, in a select group or you don't need anyone's approval to participate. It's just if you want to take this exit and you you want to preserve your financial sovereignty and you want to keep control of uh, your wealth, you can do it. It's it's an open road for anyone who wants to walk the walk. Comes with a price. You have to learn. That's the price of admission. You have to learn. You have to develop some basic skills in managing uh, your private keys and doing some basic uh, verifications uh, before you do a transaction is is a learning curve that it's nowhere near as complex at, as the first internet was. But uh, There's but still there's... a learning curve. You're right. I still remember learning not to transfer the money wasn't that hard to an exchange to buy, but actually getting my money off the exchange and putting it in a wallet yeah. was like a big challenge at the time. It's still today, whenever I move some money – or some Bitcoin or crypto to my private wallet, I'm always like, oh, I hope I didn't mess up. You know, yeah. and, I, and I feel like I'm pretty well uh, knowledgeable in it. I don't claim to be the world's expert, but I feel like I, I, I know what I'm doing. And I still am kind of like, oh, I hope I didn't mess up checking my numbers twice, you know. But that's a new habit that you have developed. It's something that you take for granted when you're transferring money on PayPal or by other any other means. It's like, well, if I mess up, I can fix it later. So it's it's not a big deal. Now, with this technology, you know that it's immutable. And once it's settled, it's settled. And that makes you develop this habit, which now it's a habit. It's not, there's no anxiety anymore. It's just a habit. You double check before you send and you double check once you send and you double check again once you receive. That's it becomes habitual, and and I think that's uh, that's a good thing, that we we verify that we become uh, responsible for our actions and and our mistakes. We own our mistakes. There's no bailouts in Bitcoin. There's no uh, no one's coming to the rescue if you lose your keys, if you send money to someone you shouldn't have sent money to, and so on. There's no bailouts, and and that's I, I think that's uh, wonderful. That's something that we have to keep that way uh, at all costs. Uh, that's that's something that I don't think anyone who understands this technology is willing to make any compromise in, in that regard. I agree completely. Hey, 
Before we go on any further, I do want to do um, a little blip here. Yeah, you know, I want to tell everybody I produce a show every week, and if you're not aware, I also produce the Four Minute Crypto Show every weekday. So when you put these two shows together, <laughs> that's a lot of time. And there are costs like production and distribution, and, and that's all cool because I really enjoy not only talking to people like you, Philippe, but I enjoy creating this content. And as I said earlier, I learned a ton of stuff by doing it, which is real helpful, but I'm kind of at a fork in the road. I'm at the point where I'm really not making enough off the shows to expand any further, and that's what I want to do. I want to ex expand this. I want to produce more videos, more podcasts. I even want to build a media network. I want to put in a studio over here. I'd like to bring in more media producers to add their content to the network. So I'm kind of asking for people. I'm not kind of. I'm asking people to consider helping sponsor my efforts. If you uh, enjoy what I'm doing here, please consider going to CryptoCousins.com slash sponsor and show me some love. You can be a one-time sponsor with cash or crypto, or you can become a monthly Patreon, which is a great way to sponsor the show. That's like being a subscriber. And, of course, everyone is still welcome to continue listening and watching the shows, even if you don't wish to sponsor my efforts. Because, to be honest with you, I really kind of do it because I like doing it, and I enjoy sharing it with everybody. But I'm just asking people listening, if you at least take a look at CryptoCousins.com slash sponsor, I'd appreciate it very much. But that's my little blip there, Philip, and trying to change the model on this instead of advertising, trying to get people to kind of back my efforts and grow it. Yeah, so. I think that's that's a, a very interesting uh, model. And, well, I encourage people to support this, this effort. I know very well it takes a, a lot of time to produce content, to do the research. Uh, so even if you're just listening for the first time, start by sharing and putting the word out that uh, Gary and Crypto Cousins are doing this effort to bring information to the community and to educate people in, in, in this technology. Yeah, even sharing. Yeah, that's true. That helps more than people realize. You know, yeah. Um, growing the audience, because even if someone goes, I really don't want to sponsor, I don't get enough out of it, or I can't afford to sponsor, or whatever the reason is, sharing Maybe someone would come along and goes, hey, I love this content, and it's, and it's worth it to me because it's kind of a value proposition model is how I'm looking at it. You know, if you see a value in it, maybe it's worth paying. If not, you still get the content. So yeah. it's, it's just a numbers game, I guess. Hey, I want to go on to something, a story I heard you tell on another podcast, which I thought was really interesting about your first experience with Bitcoin when you were trying to transfer some money. Well, just a brief backstory. As I uh, mentioned uh, in the beginning, I developed voice over IP uh, software and protocols. And uh, voice over IP is uh, basically making phone calls over the internet, which can be peer to peer, but there's no way to extract value. And this is this is an important point that I'm going to go back in in a moment. So you can connect one peer to the other, one one end to the other and make them talk to each other, but you cannot ex extract value unless you have someone in the middle. So that was my mentality when I was developing software to extract this value from this conversation in terms of charging for, for the service, I need to put something in the middle. So I've been doing a consulting, working with projects all over uh, the world, and I got a contract uh, with a company in one of those countries that you wouldn't want to go without a private army, right? So it was an audit that I was doing for this company. Uh, they sent me the first uh, uh, retainer payment and PayPal didn't like the origin of those funds. So they froze my, my account for uh, 30 days. Okay, so <laughs> then I try with my bank account. I said, well, it's it's an established company. It's not there's no embargo in this specific country. It's it's a place I wouldn't want to go, but it should be fine. So again, I get the transfer, the money transfer, and phone call from the risk department of my bank, and that they flagged this uh, transaction, and it, it was going to be on hold for seven days. So it was a nightmare. I was trying to get paid for something uh, that it was nothing illegal. And the financial system, it was roadblock after roadblock and freezing accounts and canceling accounts. And I'm like, OK, let's try this Bitcoin thing, which I 
I have to admit, I didn't fully research what Bitcoin was. I just knew that you could send and receive uh, money with Bitcoin. So I downloaded the, the wallet, uh, sent my client the uh, um, wallet uh, address, and they sent me Bitcoin. And I'm like, okay, I don't know anything about this Bitcoin. So I sold it immediately and didn't put, uh, put much uh, thought into that. Then the second payment uh, came and I, same process, I received Bitcoin, I sell the Bitcoin. And the second time I got like something like 15% more than the first time. And I'm like, mm, hmm, that's good. I mean, <laughs> I'm happy. It's, it's the same amount of Bitcoin, but I got more dollars. Good. So the third time it was uh, something like 30% 30, 30 more than the first time. And I'm like, what's going on here? So then I started researching and then I, I, I read the white paper and it was like a light bulb went on and it, I said, this is it. This is the next internet. It, it's, it was the same feeling I got the first time I saw loading uh, a web page back in 1994, 93 or 94, I think. It was the same, like, this is going to change the world and... Uh, it was amazing. It was uh, my first approach to Bitcoin was uh, out of need. I, um, I needed to uh, move money from one place to another. But when I realized how ingenious the solution was, I knew that it was, this was going to change the world. Going back to my point of uh, being able to extract value, voice over IP is the same protocol. It's a peer-to-peer -peer communication protocol. But with my mentality as a software engineer working with those kind of protocols, you couldn't charge money without having someone in the middle. So I couldn't conceive that you could transfer money with, without someone in the middle. And that was my fault. Otherwise, perhaps I would have been Satoshi, but, uh, but I couldn't figure out how you could do something like that without a third party, without an intermediary. And when I realized that this guy nailed it, or gal, or group of guys, or whomever Satoshi is, are, or where. They nailed it. They really solved the problem of a double spending and a system that enables you to transfer value from one party to another without any intermediary, without any censorship, without any blockages or barriers of entry. So. That's how I got into Bitcoin. And, and when I read the, the white paper and I read it once and then I read it a second time and I was like, this is going to be huge. This is it. And I haven't uh, stopped learning about Bitcoin since, since then. Well, that was definitely uh, an example of how Bitcoin freed you to control your money. Yeah. In that situation. I mean, you couldn't get your money because someone else didn't think you should have it for whatever the reason. Exactly. And, and why does anyone have a right to tell you if you can have your money or not? You know? Well, the premise is that it's always been like that. And if you dare to read any contract with a bank, when, when you open an account, you're pretty much relinquishing to any right or say or anything regarding your money. It's their money. Once you give them money, it's their money. And they can do whatever they want. And it has... Obviously, over time, got into a point where they can even conduct criminal activity. They, they get away with things that you and I would be in jail in no time. If we were like uh, forging uh, your customers' uh, information or opening bank accounts uh, with uh, stolen identities, uh, man, we would be in jail in, in, in weeks. Or right? If we were loaning out money we didn't have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, since they like what for every dollar they get in, they can loan out so many dollars. I mean, they don't have half the money they're get they're loaning. Yeah, so uh, it has gotten to to uh, a point where it's incredible what they can get away with. And uh, for you and I, we operate in a completely different set of rules. So one of the things that I I think we 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 both appreciate about this technology is that there's no one single entity that can change the rules. Because every time that happens, that entity ends up changing the rules to benefit uh, themselves, right? To protect their privilege, to protect their advantage. Well, that's that's I think human nature to protect what you got. Yeah, and when you have a protocol which makes up for that human flaw, basically, and says, 
okay, no, no one can do that thing that you have been doing on, uh, for a long time, then the dynamic completely shifts and it changes and we're discovering what are all the implications in terms of regulation, in terms of uh, human interaction, in terms of how we resolve our problems and how we uh, reach consensus. Uh, these models of governance that are being explored and um, there's a lot of uh, heated debate among Bitcoiners and maximalists and minimalists and most minimalists and all these groups that are arguing over things like governance. And for some, it's just a sham. For some, it's just a, uh, everything is a scam. But I think exploring uh, governance models uh, using protocols, it's a huge adva advancement for society. And we're just scratching the surface. We haven't seen anything yet. And the technology is developing. And uh, as of today, the only thing that I would consider to be proven to work is Bitcoin. And the only level of consensus that we can all agree on is the state of a transaction at any given point in time. That's how far our consensus is right now as proven consensus. But but it's a stepping stone and it's a, our first attempt and always our first attempts are by definitions the, the worst. So it's only going to get better and we're going to be able to reach consensus uh, faster over way more complex matters than a single state of uh, transaction. You know, a, a story we talked about, gosh, quite a while ago now, I can't remember, it's been before Pit Block Boom, that we were talking about is the state of money in countries like Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And I just found that conversation so interesting. And the more I news articles I see about the financial situation there and how Bitcoin and crypto have really taken off there in that even with Bitcoin going down, what, 80%, 85%, if you put your boulevards into Bitcoin oh yeah, back when it started going down, you are still so far ahead of the game, even with an 85% drop because the boulevards dropped, what, 10,000% or something. Yeah, it's in, insane. The, the... Yeah, you told me about this, and you told me about they were making purses out of Venezuelan boulevards because they got more money for the purses than the money was worth. So let's let's talk about this whole situation down there. The currency, the, the paper notes are worthless. They're not even worth the, the paper they're printed in. And people are using it to uh, make threaded purses and wallets. And actually, <laughs> funny thing, I was... Uh, talking to uh, uh, one of my subscribers in Venezuela, and he was like, I'll, I'll send you some, but just be aware that probably there's traces of cocaine in the bills. So I'm like, ah, probably I'll pass. But yeah, they're using the bills, the, the notes, to make things. And in some cases, they're using it just as fuel, just to burn them, because uh, the currency is, is worthless. There's, there's no value in, in the Bolivar. Now, Venezuela is, is, of course, in the most extreme uh, right now, but there are other countries that are following closely. And one of them, Argentina, the Argentinian peso has lost almost 60% of value this year. The Iran uh, real uh, has also uh, lost close to uh, 60%. The Turkish lira and it's one after the other that you see these phenomena of uh, hyperinflation. The, suddenly, the government starts printing money to pay subsidies and to pay for their uh, everyday operation. And suddenly, the money is, is worthless. And even if you had the money, there's nothing to buy. So the uh, Venezuelan economy is, is completely devastated. They have depleted all their resources. Even they have oil extraction operations that are are basically ghost uh, towns because they don't have the money to run them anymore. Now Russia is going to be working the oil operations in in Venezuela. So at the end of the day, is is the the little guy that suffers the con the consequences of these uh, irresponsible governments over and over and over and over. For the first time in history, I know firsthand of people in Venezuela that are preserving uh, some of their wealth in Bitcoin, and they're using cryptocurrencies 
the adoption of Dash, for example, in small uh, shops and commerce in, in Venezuela is through the roof. And people are, are just using anything other than government issue uh, currency. So I think it's what I see in the future, uh, unfortunately, for, for many countries. We're heading for, uh, uh, in my opinion, one of the worst crises that we've seen in our lifetimes. And uh, if you see all the derivative markets and the level of debt of governments and companies and individuals and you name it, everything is, uh, everyone is up to their eyeballs in, in debt. So... I see that we're going to, uh, in the coming months, we're going to start seeing more and more countries in in situations like Venezuela, hopefully not to the extreme that uh, Venezuela is, is has reached. But uh, yeah, I'm expecting to see more countries in this um, dire situation. And that's one of the senses of, that gives me a sense of urgency to put out word in, in Latin America, to talk to people about this option and educate them on, on how they, they can preserve, even if it's just a few dollars, just preserve whatever you can preserve in uh, cryptocurrency, in hard assets, uh, protect yourselves from the rapacious uh, governments. And uh, at the end of the day, I think this time around, it's going to be different for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think you're correct on that, too. I was watching something on TV about Venezuela, and I, I just remember saying there, I said, that's really kind of amazing. That country has some of the biggest oil reserves in the world, yep. and it wasn't that long ago that it was like a prosperous country. In the 1990s, uh, Venezuela one, was one of the wealthiest uh, countries in Latin America. I mean, they had gas stations uh, in the United States, which were all closed up. I mean... Um, so it's just amazing how quickly that happened, I guess is what I'm I'm saying. It wasn't like it was a long, long process. It happened almost overnight, it seems like. Well, it was. Uh, Chavez got elected in 2000 and probably 2001 or two, if I if I remember correctly. But it was in the early 2000s from that to 2000, uh, really to 2013 was like, things uh, start uh, as accelerating dramatically. But uh, it was a, a period of uh, 10, uh, 15 years of uh, socialist governments, and they devastated everything. I mean, General Mot Motors had uh, huge operations in Venezuela. There was car manufacturers, and there was like a food industry. Uh, Kellogg's had a huge operation in Venezuela. I mean, it was a very wealthy country. There was a bunch of industries that were flourishing a few years before uh, the socialist Chavez uh, took over. And it was a few years when the really oil was around $100 per barrel that he was throwing money left and right to buy alliances uh, throughout Latin America. But they blew all the money from high oil price and it's been downhill since then. So, and at the end of the day, is is the Venezuelan people who end up paying for their government's uh, a lack of integrity and the devastation of the economy. It always hits the most vulnerable, and it's hitting them hard. And their massive migration and the ones who are staying, they are in survival mode. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame. It's a shame. Well, hopefully. Um... You just got to pray things get better for them down there. Well, it can't go like this forever. I mean, there's something has to has to give, and at some point, it's it's gonna it's inevitable. It's when you see history in perspective, there's gonna be a, a backlash to what's happening right now, and I really have no idea how that backlash is gonna look like. But it's probably gonna be similar to what happened uh, with the uh, exile of uh, the Basque country in Spain. So people that fled from the uh, socialist regime are living abroad. Some of them are prospering, are making money. They're gonna start taking over the dynamic inside the country, and eventually they're they're gonna be strong enough to replace the current government. Also, there's other geopolitical factors there. Uh, there's a huge pressure in the Venezuelan-Colombian border. Uh, now 
Brazil, it's also having a far right government, so it's going to clash with Venezuela. So there's a lot of moving parts that I think are going to precipitate huge uh, changes in in the coming uh, years in Venezuela. Who are a couple of people you follow in the uh, crypto space? Well, I follow Andreas. I pretty much beat uh, Block Boom uh, speaker lineup. I uh, Pierre Rochard and Sifidia Namus and Nick Batia. I'm always reading what uh, they are putting in terms of uh, the development aspect. Jameson Loop is someone I, I, I really follow closely. Luke Dash Jr., also I follow him. When he stop, talks about cryptocurrency, when he gets into his mystical thing, I kind of skip the, that part, but uh, <laughs> the technology is very, very interesting. And um, that's pretty much the daily intake of what's going on in the, in the space. A few others, but those would be the main drivers and people who are in the making, because all of them, uh, Elizabeth Stark also from uh, the Lightning Network, those are the people who are really involved in the in the development, are making the things that are going to have a huge impact in development, in the how we think and how we perceive things like trust, like identity, like value, and concepts that uh, are are being fundamentally uh, challenged with uh, this technology. Right. Well, speaking of Bitblock Boom, which you spoke at, and I appreciate that. Matter of fact. Tickets go on sale for next year's Big Block Boon, January the 15th, Awesome! if, if my memory is correct. Um, so people may want to check that out January 15th. We had a great event, I thought. Yeah, I think it was um, uh, really well put together. I, I commend you and Tony for the effort and all, all. it was very well organized, top of the line speakers. I think it was uh, a very an amazing event. Did you come to the, uh, I can't remember, did you come to the Bitcoin brunch on Sunday? No. You missed, that was a good time. You missed a good time. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of Pierre, he's next week's guest, so to let everybody know. Um, so next week we'll have Pierre on, and Pierre is um, with Bitcoin Advisory and uh, one of the founders of Satoshi Nakamoto Institute, mm -hmm. and uh, they're doing those Bitcoin maximalist dinners. <laughs> Those, yeah. Yeah, that was good, too. <laughs> well, I'm going to uh, say thank you for coming on. Anything you want to tell our audience before we get out of here? And how can people find you if they want to follow you? Well, they can find me. I tweet in English in my personal Twitter, uh, which is Felipe. And probably it's going to be better if I give you the link and you put the link somewhere in the description so they don't have It'll to. It'll be in the show notes. Yeah, my Personal Twitter is mostly English, and my Spanish-speaking uh, platform is uh, CryptomonedasTV.com. So that's where I talk about all this fascinating space that we're in in Spanish. And I want to encourage your audience to support the effort that you're doing with uh, cryptocurrency and with uh, your podcast, with the platform, with the media. And I think you, you bring a lot of value uh, to the community and people are going to be receive a lot of benefit from following what you do and supporting your efforts. Well, thanks. I appreciate that very much. Well, thanks again for coming on today's show and I look forward to seeing you soon. I know we're running each other somewhere, hopefully before August and Bitblock Boom, we're running each other somewhere. Uh, we seem to go to a lot of the same things and that's it for today's show. Thanks everyone for listening and thank you again, Philippe, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed today's show. A big thank you to all the cousins out there that are showing their support by donating, subscribing, and leaving great reviews on iTunes. All of those things help more than you realize. Now, you can subscribe almost anywhere podcasts are available by going to CryptoCousins.com slash subscribe. Call me with your comments or questions at 747 Nine four seven one, or you can email me at the crypto cousins at gmail dot com, and I'll try to use these on future episodes. Please take a peek at the Four Minute Crypto Show, which is produced every weekday and located at four minute crypto dot com. It's the place to get your daily dose of crypto news, and it's always four minutes or less. And one last thing, please take a look at my new website, Crypto Crybaby. 
This website is for the true crypto fan and sells Bitcoin and crypto gear like T-shirts, caps, and so much more. Take a look at CryptoCryBaby.com today. Thanks again for listening. Love you guys. Thanks for listening to the Crypto Cousins podcast. Please share the show with your friends. They can subscribe by going to CryptoCousins.com slash subscribe. And if you want to know more about Gary, just go to GaryLeland.com. Make sure and join Gary and all the Crypto Cousins every week for a new episode of the Crypto Cousins podcast. The Crypto Cousins podcast and the information included in the podcast are not intended as investment advice. Investing in any cryptocurrency is risky, and you should never invest more than you can afford to lose. Always seek professional advice before investing in any cryptocurrency. Please understand, you are using any and all information from the Crypto Cousins at your own risk.